and of course, uh, thank you, Ms. Nuzalani, for uh, coming to the Insight Series and suggesting, uh, suggesting this uh, very important topic, uh, commemorating uh, the World Environment Day. So may I give you the floor to introduce our uh, Thank you, Alexia. Eid uh, Futter Mubarak to everyone, and uh, good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to see you all uh, on this, uh, to commemorate the World Environment uh, Day. Uh, I don't want to preempt the, the, uh, what we have planned for tomorrow. You know that the World Environment Day is on the 5th of June, but because it was the Eid, we uh, planned it for tomorrow. But I'd like to urge you all to come uh, as staff because it's very important the whole message in the world environment day which is on air pollution uh, is to walk the talk basically uh, what can we do as staff members to to show that we uh, that we can the, the little measures that we can do uh, go a long way uh, through um, and today we're starting uh, uh, it's it's um, uh, a prelude to to that event tomorrow and we are happy to have uh, Dr. Najat uh, Saliba with us also tomorrow to say the key messages, but today it's more of a technical uh, input uh, or, or technical presentation that will tell us how, uh, uh, what sort of air we are breathing in, uh, in Lebanon, uh, what is our situation in terms of air pollution, and uh, where are we going to, and hopefully we can uh, get to the discussion where we say what can be done and what should be done, or what cannot be done at this stage, but hopefully more things can be done than cannot be done. Uh, doctor, we're, we're honored to have uh, Dr. Saliba with us. She's a professor at uh, the American University of Beirut. Uh, she, is, she, has, uh, uh, she, she is a, uh, in the department of um, uh, of chemistry uh, in the Faculty of Arts and Science. Um, more importantly, she's an activist. She really, uh, I think, takes the action beyond academia to, to work on the issues of uh, uh, the, the, the safety of the environment and addressing air pollution. She has worked extensively in this area, both at looking at sources of pollution and their impact on human hands, on the city, and on our environment, and uh, um, what could be done again in this uh, uh, in, in this regard? She's uh, uh, she has won. She has been recognized uh, in Lebanon and worldwide. Uh, with uh, she has been awarded the L'Oréal UNESCO uh, International Award for Women in Science, uh, and the National Order of the Cedar from the President of the Lebanese. Uh, Republic and, uh, and, uh, and the honorary Cedar Shield from the Speaker of the Parliament of Lebanon and, uh, and other uh, recognition in terms of her uh, writings, articles and books and uh, we're very happy to have you, uh, Dr. Najan. Uh, we will start with the presentation and then open the floor for, uh, uh, for questions and comments. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hi. Thank yep. you. <laughs> uh, it's really a great honor to be here among you. Thank you for the invitation. And indeed, I am Mubarak al um, I'm sorry, I don't have uh, very good news to start with. This is an article that was published yesterday by the National, say, you know, and the reporter actually called me to get some facts that I will share with you today. And uh, probably all of you have seen the haze that of Beirut these past days. So this was the headline news at the National World Environment Day, Beirut's haze, a sign the city is losing its battle with the smog. Um, I'm assuming everybody knows what smog is, right? It's smoke and fog together. That's where the smog comes from. So with this, we, I'm going to start with my presentation. I thought it just puts the stage and the tone of where we're heading. Although I wanted to start with the happy news uh, that uh, the award that I got this year 
was uh, celebrating the first woman doing science in Lebanon uh, and to be honored among the top five scientists in the world. So it's the first time a Lebanese woman doing science in Lebanon is very <laughs> So the topic of my presentation today is I chose only one particular component, one particular uh, chemical that I would like to talk about and how in our daily activities, whether we live in Daura or Zoo in Beirut at AUB or anywhere else, we are exposed to this one of the carcinogens that are the most uh, uh, deadly in the atmosphere. So deadly, daily inhalation of carcinogens like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And uh, to start, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators and the funding agencies that helped in actually contributing to the work and starting with the U.S. Federal and Drug Administration, the U.S. National Institute of Health, and I will tell you later why the U.S. is interested in some of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon that, that we are inhaling here in Lebanon the American University Research Board, the Lebanese National Council for Scientific Research, and the Southern California Particle Center and Supersite at the University of Southern California. My collaborators, Tom Eisenberg from Virginia Commonwealth University, Isam Lais and Alan Shadi from AUB, and Costa Ciotos from USC. Uh, I will go over different environments in Lebanon. So whether you live in an urban environment or in a remote environment, you will be able to identify what I'm talking about. So I will start with what we call an ambient level of PAHs. First of all, we define what PAHs are. And then we go to the uh, exposure of PAHs next to a traffic site. And then we move to the zoo where the power plant is. And then we talk about the density of diesel generators in Beirut and how much this affects our inhalation of carcinogens. And last but not least, uh, if you top it all off by smoking a water pipe, you will know how much of these carcinogens you will be adding to the inhalation. Uh, what are the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons? They're usually coming off with the soot, so anytime you see black smoke, the black smoke is basically elemental carbon, like carbon, and also sheets of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So sheets meaning a multitude of benzene rings attached together that form what we call the, the, the black smoke. So they are usually originated from incomplete, com incomplete combustion. So anytime there is an incomplete combustion, there is emission of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, so this is I'm not, this is how the mechanisms happen. So uh, you start with a small particle because you have high temperature, they combine together and they grow in number of benzene rings. So for example, we have the naphthalene. Everybody has heard of naphthalene. And what we have also is the benzoapyrene. The benzoapyrene, this one is formed of five benzene rings attached together. And this uh, uh, compound here is considered type 1 carcinogen by IR. So most of my presentation will focus of, on how much benzoapyrene we are inhaling in different environments. Okay? So just remember this benzoapyrene because we're going to talk about it from, you know, for them in the next half hour a lot. Okay? So this is BAP. Uh, what are the sources of combustion? When we talk about sources of combustion, we're talking about traffic because cars are actually engines and they combust fuel. We were talking about diesel generators, of course. We talk about power plants where heavy fuel oil is burned. And we could also be talking about open burning in some of the sites, especially in, during the waste crisis where we had lots of open burning sites. So what happens when all of this uh, uh, fume come, go in, you know, goes into the air? After it goes into the air, it settles. And what we call ambient environment is 
what happens to the air every, after everything comes off and then settles. That's ambient environment. Ambient is what's left in the air after all these emission sources have put out some smoke. So to assess this, there are certain criteria. You have to be away from any direct source by 200 meters. And that's why we chose AUB as a good place to measure what we call an urban background or ambient air. So when we measure polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons on a, uh, on the AUB side, what we found is that the levels are high in the winter and they're low in the summer. The reason why they dropped in this, they drop in the summer, is because they photooxidize, meaning they react under sunlight and they decompose to go into more harmful products that we did not assess. So in winter, you have less solar radiation, and that's why you have you know, a, a longer life for the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon for us to be able to capture them. So when we talk about benzoapyrene, which is one of the components of this polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, of course, it's going to follow the same trend. And you see high levels in the winter, low level in the summer. What, what we would like to point out here is that the EU regulation limits the amount of BAP or benzoapyrene in the air to be one microgram per meter cube. And you see that if BAHs do not decompose, if BAP does not decompose, we are in the winter or we exceed in the winter the levels that are set by the EU. And also, I would like to point out that in the UK, this level is 0 0.25 nanograms per meter cubed, which means it's much, much lower than we could reach in, in Lebanon. What was interesting and important is to assess what are the sources of these PAHs around the AUB, the AUB site. Okay, and we did some uh, matrix factorization calculation and we found that there are three major sources uh, uh, that are affecting the levels of PAHs around the AUB site. And they are the diesel generators, the incinerator of the hospital, and the gasoline meaning traffic. So it's extremely important to look at this pie chart here and uh, understand that 55% of the benzoapyrene comes from traffic. And then we have a substantial amount that comes from diesel generator and a small amount that comes from the incinerator around the AUB. So because the question is how much traffic is contributing to the level of pollution in Beirut, this was the first time this was assessed. And it's around over 50% of, uh, uh, of contribution. So traffic is a problem. We wanted to assess traffic. So how much of BAP is emitted from traffic? And for that, we went and put our uh, equipment next to gelatin. Okay, on the side road of Jalidi. And the question was, okay, we have this site, but what do we compare it with? So then we decided to compare it to another city like Los Angeles. Why? Because in Los Angeles, they have as many cars as we do on the streets. It's not like we have more cars on the street. They have long, they have large, large freeways and they have a huge number of cars. What is the difference between the two cities? Our city is not regulated. There are lacks of regulations. Whereas in Los Angeles, there are stringent regulations. So the question was, if we take particles in Los Angeles and we take particles in Beirut, do they compare? Do they have the same chemical composition? Do, which one is more toxic? And does regulation matter? But at the end of the day, we just wanted to see whether regulation matters or not. Okay, and so what we found here is that the level, the level of particles that we measured in Jalidib is much, much higher than what we measured in Los Angeles. And remember, those are the two sites next to traffic, both of them, the same sites. And what was even more surprising is that the levels that we measured in LA were even lower than what we measured at AUB, considering for us AUB is a good place away from direct sources. 
was what, what was even more interesting is that when we looked at the toxicity, ROS means reactive oxygen species that we can find in particulate matter. If you can see here, the levels of toxicity in, uh, in LA were very, very low compared to what we measured next to the traffic site and at AUB. And so when we looked at the chemical composition, I mean the content of these particles, we saw that the amount of BAP, the carcinogen material that I talked about, is much, much lower in Los Angeles than it was in Beirut. And uh, to summarize this, we see that the levels of carcinogens next to a traffic site in Beirut is up to seven times higher than what we measured in Los Angeles. Remember, this is same comparison, same particle, almost the same site. Gram for gram, we take the same particle mass, the same everything, we find higher toxicity in Beirut. And we wanted to investigate why. Why is it that if we sit next to a traffic, we find the same, you know, higher toxicity? So we did this one-year study of how, ma how many cars we have, what are the models of these cars, what is the age of these cars, and so on and so forth. And this was not easy because the data is not available easily in Lebanon. And what we found is that we have an old fleet. That means most of the cars in Lebanon are old. Meaning, so if you look at this uh, heat map here, you can see that most of the cars in 2005, you know, they are, you know, this yellow place here tells you about the age of the car. Wherever we see yellow, it tells you about the age and the numbers. So what we found is that, let me get to that, and then I'll explain the other one. No, no. So what we found is that we have around 1,500,000 cars in 2015. The age of these cars, of these vehicles, was 13 in 2005. And because there is no system or no program to remove the old cars from the streets, that's why the age is increasing and it's not decreasing. And the age of the cars now, not now, I mean in 2015, was averaging around 19 years of age, which, which is a problem. That means most of our cars are running on old technology. And old technology means higher emission. So when we look at the emission of the vehicles per kilogram of fuel burned, so if you burn a fuel, a kilogram of fuel, how much emission do you get? And we found that the emissions in Beirut are much, much higher than the emissions that were calculated for a California freeway that is California 110. Okay, so, so one of the problems that we can attribute this higher toxicity to is the age of the car and the lack of regulations. Now moving into another source of pollution and that is the zoo power plant. And this came about, I mean this project came about because the head of the municipality in the zoo, in the zoo in Kegel area, wanted to know whether or not this black smoke is dangerous to the residents living in zoo. So he came to us, he approached us and he wanted us to do a scientific assessment of the chemicals that are put out by the black smoke in the area. So in order for us to do this, we went to the, to the power plant itself. We understood from them that they have four steam engines that run on heavy fuel oil, which is really something that does not burn efficiently. It's known heavy fuel oils do not burn efficiently. And they have to run on average of 2.5 units continuously. They don't stop. This means that, you know, after doing the calculation that all of, you know, these engines emit 1770 kilograms of total suspended particles per day, meaning that if we talk about the particles that are harmful to the body, which is PM10, 10, 10 micrometer in diameter or less, uh, these engines emit around 1000 kilogram per day from the chimney, not in the ambient air, of course. So in order to understand what happens uh, to, to the fume or to the plume that comes out from the chimney of the zoo, 
Dr. Raisamla is, is a modeler, so he ran a simulation. So what you see here, for example, those are the days of the year. So you have the number of days running. The arrows, the white arrows, are the wind direction and speed. So the bigger the, uh, the, the arrow, the higher the speed of the, uh, of the wind. And the direction of the arrow tells you about the wind direction. So we ran, we ran this uh, simulation over the whole year to see how the plume is circulating and what are the areas that will be mostly affected by, by the plume that is emitted from the area. And what we found is that, you know, the plume covers a very large area and it can go all the way to Ajatun and probably Rayfun and above and from this side it can reach up to Baabda. So in order for us to see how much of these benzoapyrene the people living in zoo are inhaling, we decided to take two sites, the highest concentration here, the highest concentration of the particle based on the simulation that we got. We put a sampler here in zone one, another sampler here in zone two, and for comparison, we took, a play, we took another sampler and we put it at a UB just to have a backup to see how much it differs from a UB to the other places. And to our surprise, what we found is that huge level of benzoapyrene in zone K in zone one, as compared to zone and to AUB. So this just confirmed that the people in zone K are not uh, in a good place, I would say. Moving to um, our, you know, the results here were very were uh, were. Um, used, I mean, the head of the municipality took those results, he shared them with the Ministry of Energy and Water, and based on the discussion that came out from those results, they decided to have a plan to monitor the emissions and also maintain the power plant. Now, whether or not this was implemented, I'm not sure, we pulled out and this was the end of our intervention. Now looking at the, at the diesel generators, which are another source of pollution, um, we wanted to know, first of all, how many diesel generators do we have in, in, a certain, in a certain environment? Like what would be the number of the diesel generators if you take a special, uh, a special area? We assume that it's going to be a lot and this is just funny because uh, there is an, a, a company that installs diesel generator that is advertising that they can do, you know, they can take the crane and install the diesel generator with any, without any problem anywhere they want in the city. So I thought this is funny that we became so creative in, in installing diesel generators in the, in the city. So to answer our questions, whether diesel generators are many and whether they are of concern, we took an area in Hamra of uh, 0.55 kilometers squared, and we went down on the ground and we started counting the number of buildings and the number of diesel generators that they are installed, and the capacity, the number of fuel, and so on and so forth. And, uh, <coughs> And so, what do you think? What would be the density of these generators? 20%. <laughs> okay, so this would be the area, and this will be the number of diesel generators. That's 50%. That means you have one diesel generator in every two buildings. Yeah. So this is the statistics. Total number of the buildings that were mapped is 588. Estimated number of generators 469. Blah blah blah. The percentage 53 percent. Density of generators is one per one kilometer squared. The average age, the average power, and the stack height. And functioning for how many hours? Oh, this was in Hamra at the time when Hamra was functioning only three hours uh, per day. So I'll show you some of the measurements that we took for, for 
PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So we had a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon monitor, and basically you can see that when the power is on, the national power is on, the PAHs are low. As soon as the generators are on, you see that the PAHs are spiking high, and then when the generator is off, the levels go back down. All right. So when we so we sat on the balconies of our colleagues who offered their homes, and I wish I can say that it was always that clear cut. In some of the places, the levels would go up and they would never go down. And then we realized that this is because in in this area, for example, the balcony was affected by two power schedules. So this would go down because it's next to them from this side, whereas you know there is another schedule going from the other side and it would go back up. So we wanted to assess the levels uh, of diesel generators only over and above the background and the traffic and everything. So we did some calculations to do this. And then what we found is that the generators contribute almost 38% to the levels of benzoapyrene or PAHs in general in any given area. How do you translate this? You translated that every one of us will be smoking two cigarettes whether they like it or not. Per <laughs> day. <laughs> So we wanted to extrapolate uh, the, what we found in Hamra to the whole city of Beirut. And uh, what we did is that we, consider, we took the topography of the, uh, of the city, we overlaid over it the wind direction, and this is like the southwest uh, wind direction prevalent. And then we took the building shape files, and of course those are courtesy of Dr. Assembla is the modeler. And then we simulated how the diesel generators are you know, putting out smoke and how the smoke is distributed over the city. And because the wind is actually pushing the pollutants in the southwest direction, you can see that the agglomeration of high levels of particle is in this area and not along this side. You know, the blue side is revealing low particulate matter levels, whereas the yellow and the red are very, very high, way above what the WHO recommends. So this is, I, I showed you how much there is exposure of PA, of the AP from diesel generators, the zoo power plant, the traffic, and the ambient level after everything settles. And now what if this person, after, after all of this, he goes into a cafe and starts smoking <laughs> and dealing. So uh, let's say the scenario is that a person lives in zoo, he comes to AUB to work, and then after work they go to have uh, Arkele. What is uh, uh, interesting and annoying is that if you can see here, this is uh, a national, st a, a, a recent study that was done in the US on the percent prevalence among youth, and you can see that Lebanon uh, uh, tops the world in the prevalence of water pipe as compared to the rest of the world. I think we have, uh, we have companions from Jordan and West Bank, you know, but this is already alarming on its own. And, uh, and well, it was interesting to start working on water pipe. And like I said at the beginning, the National Institute of Health, the US National Institute of Health, and the US Federal and Drug Administration gave us money to study water pipe and to study electronic cigarettes, not because they care about our youth, because it's the water pipe has become also a prevalent habit or uh, habit of smoke in the US as well. And they wanted to know whether this is alarming, this is affecting the health of their youth, and that's why this whole study started. And this is in collaboration with uh, Professor Alan Shahadi, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering at AUB, and Professor Tom Eisenberg from the Virginia Commonwealth University. And when we started, uh, we wanted to understand whether uh, the smoke that is generated follows the same 
engineering as cigarettes. And whether the same thing, we would expect the same type of compounds, the same model and everything. So the first thing we wanted to know is whether the tobacco burns at the same temperature as it does in cigarettes. And what we found is that while the cigarette burns at 900 degrees C, the, the tobacco with the charcoal, they burn at a much lower temperature, at 450 degrees C, meaning that the combustion process is going to be all different. And what happens when the air is sucked in, as it goes down, you can see that the color of the arrow is changing. That means the air starts hot and it starts cooling off. And by the time it gets to the water, it's already smoke. Meaning, why is this so, so important? Because the smoke does not reach the water. It bubbles very little in the water and does not dissolve in the water, contrary to what everybody thinks, that the water is going to dissolve most of the toxins. It doesn't because, because the smoke is generated or is formed way above the water and it starts going to the inhaler before it even reaches the water. Some of it reaches the water and it just start forming some bubbles that do not have time to sit in the water to dissolve. So from a mechanical point of view, a physical point of view, this is not possible. We wanted to study it also from a mechanical point of view. And to do this, we did two um, uh, setups. Uh, this, the first setup here will collect filters from the mouth of the inhaler, from here. So all of these are filters that we collect to study the chemistry. And we wanted also to see whether people sitting next to somebody who is smoking, whether they would be exposed to any of these chemicals. And that's why we built this chamber around the surrounding of the, of the water pipe. So we would call this the side stream smoke, and then this is the mainstream smoke. And uh, to smoke the ergili, we wanted to know what, how many puffs should we do, how, many ta how much should we wait between one puff and the second. And to assess all these variables, students went from one cafe to a second, registering why people and how people smoke the ergili. So, and then we compiled all these, we averaged them out, and we defined all these parameters. The, the total puff volume is 530 milliliter, the puff frequency is 17 seconds, puff duration is, um, is uh, 2.6 seconds, and a session dura duration can go to 60 minutes, number of puffs is 171 puffs, and all this. And all of these have made what we call now the Beirut method. So Professor Shahadi did this, and he didn't name it under his name. He named it under the Beirut method. And a lot of scientific articles now refer to it as the Beirut method, the method that we use in order to uh, compare. I mean, if I want to compare a session here and outside Lebanon, we should have the same parameters. And when people refer to a smoking session, they refer to these parameters. And we created a robot in the lab that will smoke continuously water pipe whenever we want to do the chemical analysis. So this is what we call reverse engineering. We reverse engineering, and I, when I say all of this has been done in the mechanical engineering lab. So we reversed the engineering of the, of the water pipe, created a robot, defined the parameters by which this robot is going to smoke, and then started assessing the chemistry. So when we assessed the chemistry, we wanted to look at polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons to see how much of this is inhaled. And if you can see here, the amount of PAHs or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are much, much higher than what we see in the, in the cigarette. Okay, and if we want to compare the BAP, the carcinogen material, from water pipe, all of these are different session, different, uh, different sessions altogether, and those are the levels of BAP that were measured in the cigarette. We can see that the levels of BAP in water pipe are much higher, or they reach a higher level than they do in the cigarette. 
So how do you translate this? So if we look at the mainstream smoke right here, you can say that the levels of BAP are equivalent to two pack of cigarettes. So if somebody is just smoking a session of, uh, of water pipe, this is equivalent to two packs of cigarettes. And if somebody is sitting next to somebody smoking a water pipe, he or she will be smoking two cigarettes. Two. So, also, you know, this BAP or polycyclic, uh, polycyclic aromatic it's hydrocarbon. Water pipe, but there are many water pipes. Oh, that's a different story. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So, another thing is that uh, since BAP or PAHs are, you know, we said they come from incomplete combustion, we thought that the major source of these BAPs are the, is the charcoal. So we wanted to look at the different charcoals that are in, uh, sold in the country, the lumber, which is the Sindhian, and then you have the king and the coconara. Apparently, on the coconara, they say that's a healthy green uh, charcoal. <laughs> and if you look at the uh, amount of PAHs that we found in the coconara, it's much higher than the other ones. <laughs> It's, it's just a charcoal that lights quickly. La, la, la. And this is just the charcoal. All, by the way, all our measurements were done on the ma'asal. We didn't measure the ajami. Uh, by the way, yeah. Well, yeah, this is the, this is the healthy uh, charcoal. Okay. And so I, I am happy to say that uh, all our results were used by many, many health organizations. The WHO has used our results to promote the anti-argili, anti-tobacco smoking all over the world. Uh, and this is based on our findings. Of course, the American Lung Association also based some of their, them, some of their uh, uh, warnings, uh, warnings uh, you know, on, uh, on our results that we published uh, internationally. And at the end, also, we have Law 174, where we pushed the government here with the help of the Faculty of Health Sciences in, uh, in AUB to adopt a Law 174 to ban water pipe smoking indoors, Hello. right? Yes. Hello, Leanno. It stayed in the drawers. <laughs> Hello, Tamina. I agree. But the law exists. <laughs> so the law was implemented for a couple months, and then it was put in the drawer. So uh, OK, away from any direct source, we have VAP 29% of the time increasing uh, above the EU limit. The VAP that we found in traffic site is seven times more than the levels in LA. The VAP that we found in zoo is 10 times more than what we found at AUB. The BAP in Hamra is equivalent to two cigarettes per day. And the BAP in water pipe, if you're inhaling in the mainstream, is equivalent to two packs of cigarettes. OK, to put this in a global context, you see that the PAHs that we have measured in Lebanon, in the zoo, and in Daura, and uh, uh, at AUB are, you know, towards they rank very, very high in the world. We're very, you know, among the people or the cities that have high levels of PAHs. How do we translate this into a cancer risk estimation? So we did, I did this incremental lifetime cancer risk. If, you're ex if you live in zoo and you're exposed to those PAPs all of your, you know, for a good number of, uh, uh, of years, then uh, this is what we get. So if you're exposed to water pipe smoke, the cancer risk is like 10 times higher than what is recommended by any organization. So this is, the others are very, very low compared to the water pipe. If we expand this region here, this region here, you can see that people living in zoo and in Daura, they exceed the limit that is recommended by a certain margin. Meaning that people who are living in Lebanon are, you know, they have a higher chance to develop cancer than other people. 
In fact, this is translated into, you know, the the data that is emitted, that is uh, published by the uh, by WHO, saying that people in Lebanon die from cardiovascular diseases and cancer mostly. But what was what is disturbing, and I would like to show you this, is that. Um, if you look at early age, younger age people, you can see that the world, in the world, people who, are, who die at young age, they die from cardiovascular diseases and then cancer. Whereas in Lebanon, in Lebanon at young age, you have cancer topping the causes of diseases more than, more than cardiovascular problems. More than accident? Uh, yes. Yes. I mean, you can see it. And, and, and uh, what was also disturbing is that Lebanon tops the world in bladder cancer, even at younger age. The, the main reason of bladder, ca bladder cancer, they say, is smoking. So, yes, I know that the picture is grim. It's not, I wish I can tell you more happy news. And we have some emerging challenges, other challenges that are emerging without given any awareness about them. We have started working on electronic cigarettes, also funded by the National Institute of Health and the US Federal Drug Administration. So we're working a lot on understanding the danger of electronic cigarettes. We, like, like Rula said, I am an activist and I will always fight for a better air, but I feel like I'm losing the battle. Uh, what are my proposed solutions? Implement Law 174. This is extremely important. Reduce emissions from air pollution by maintaining power plants engines. So I'm not dreaming. I'm just saying like those are just things that we can do. They exist. Scrapage plan for old cars. Remo remove old cars and give incentives to buy new cars. Eliminate the need for diesel generators. I don't, I don't believe that we should accept living with diesel generator smoke anytime, anywhere. I think this is the minimum that we can ask. And before all of these are implemented, I think everybody should stop even thinking about incinerators or burning. Now they're talking about burning some of these of the waste in cement burners. We cannot accept any of this before any of before the above is implemented and controlled. Definitely, we need we need all the help we can get to raise awareness among residents, empower the local residents with evidence, and that's why I'm everywhere talking about the same thing over and over and over again. Involve the local residents with the data collection, analysis, and co-design of the solution, and this is what we're refer we're we're you know, going to now by including people in the decision making, trying to do this, promoting citizen science, low cost monitor, public participatory approach. In fact, we have started at the Nature Conservation Center, because I'm the director of the center, to, to involve the citizens in the decision making by empowering them, teaching them the science, telling them the science giving them the tools to measure the science. And we're actually pioneering on this. And I'm also proud to uh, prepare the next laureate that is many of the women that are working in my lab to empower them and also push them to do good and, uh, and be the next fighters in the future. And I'm happy to show you that all these efforts have been recognized internationally. Uh, we visited um, uh, Mrs. Macron when we were there and given the award. I was also uh, at the UNESCO receiving the award with my husband. I was honored by the President of the Republic and by the Speaker of the House and at the end by my village, the Moor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Najat, for a very engaging uh, uh, presentation, uh, gloomy indeed, <laughs> what we are facing. But uh, as you pointed out, there are things we can do, definitely on the smoking. 
definitely on our habits and the use of electricity and the, the diesel, uh, the traffic uh, here in Esqua, we, uh, the, the executive secretary is launching a, um, an initiative tomorrow. It will start, it's supposed to start in July to have carpooling with incentives to forego the, the parking fees for electric cars and for carpooling. Uh, there is so much that can be done, but definitely without the policy context, without the le legislation, without enforcement, uh, not much can be done. Uh, but uh, and, and we thank you again for being an activist and for not stopping uh, the fight. Uphill fight, but, uh, but I think uh, uh, there is a lot that can be done. With that, I'd like to open the floor for uh, Questions, comments, I will take a round. Uh, if you can uh, please introduce yourself so that uh, yeah, to, to Dr. Najat and, uh, uh, and and state what you would like to say, and then I'll start thinking. I'll start with Tare, and then I have uh, uh, Jose. Uh, thank you, Rola. Tare uh, Psalik, Water Resources Section, Sustainable Development Policies Division. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nagat, for this very alarming uh, presentation. A lot of that uh, information that uh, should really be well disseminated and analyzed by different sectors, so we can know also some uh, social economic impacts of this. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, lifetime cycle of the PDHs, like uh, are they short-lived in the air or in the atmosphere? Can we have uh, some baseline data to measure the lowest level of pollution during the evening so we can know some order of magnitudes of change of pollutants within this lifetime cycle during days, during hours, or weeks, and how long they will live at the long term if we want to have uh, accumulation of the pollutants and to work out the budget uh, of uh, pollutants in the atmosphere for greenhouse gases, etc. Uh, my uh, last issue is uh, how you measure the source impact relation on health impacts, how you can distinguish some signatures for air pollution, water quality pollution, other kind of uh, impacts. So can you find a clear cut between those? And will hospitals uh, disclose the information needed of patients to analyze this? Thank you. Would you like to take or you'd like to respond? No, I, want to I prefer to respond by yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you, Tarek, for all these questions. Those are <laughs> heavy questions. Okay, for the for the lifetime of the PAHs, some of them they live days and some of them live few hours. Okay, and not more. Now there is a big debate whether PAHs should be considered as, pers as persistent organic pollutants or not. It's because when they oxidize or they react with nitrogen oxides, they form the nitro PAHs. Then they become they become more stable. Now, whether or not how fast do they degrade, that depends on the level of ozone and the level of NO2 and also the solar radiation. So it's a factor of these two oxidants in addition to the solar to the solar radiation. So it will change from one place to another, but some of them can oxidize in few hours. They don't last long. Uh, so that's why the debate is going whether pHs should be pops or not. So this is that's why I'm assuming that you're uh, asking this question, which is extremely important. PAHs are known to be ingested with food. For example, if you take barbecue food, that's, you have PAHs there. They can also be absorbed by the skin. There is a dermal exposure, and there is the inhalation. So in order for us to assess the health effect of the in, you know, intake of PAHs, we have to consider the three routes. What I did here is only a back of the envelope calculation of assuming that there is one route of exposure and that is 